Act 5, Scene 7 is important in terms of Macbeth's, the, the final movement, the final phase of Macbeth's move towards his destruction and also towards a final poetic realization. Therefore, in this scene, even though it takes place in the midst of war, even though that is civil war, even though it takes place in the midst of a crisis, we see the revelations in Macbeth coming out in this moment of fight, in this moment of defiance. At the beginning of Act 5, Scene 7, he says, They have tied me to a stake. I cannot fly. But bear-like I must course. What's he that was not a woman, not born of woman? Such a one I am to fear, or none. It's important that even though he realizes that he is in the last phase of his life, that he is not quite invincible, that he is almost like a bear tied to a stake about to be burnt. Uh, here, uh, just to make you all remember that cockfighting and bear baiting were very important uh, forms of entertainment during Shakespeare's time, almost as popular as theatre. Therefore, if uh, a number of groundlings would go to watch Shakespeare's theatre, they had other options like cockfighting and bear baiting. Therefore, to actually relate a main character, the leading character in a play to uh, a bear who is tied to a stake is really the Shakespearean way of making a tragic character so much more realistic and so much more relatable not only to the intellectuals but more to the groundlings, the pit audience who come to watch the play and understand it according to the references of their world. So here it's basically to say that um, Macbeth is being compared to a bear tied at stake about to be burned. Even at this point when he is, he feels, he realizes that he is cornered, he still uh, puts his hope or casts his hope on saying on, on the on one of the equivocating statement of the witches that is uh, he who is not born of woman will be able to finally defeat him and he says that who can there be a person like that if mo it's, it's really impossible to find a person like that, therefore he shouldn't be fearing anyone at all. And it is at this moment that young Seward, that is the son of the king, the English king, enters and uh, it's he's, he's a very young, uh, he's a young man and he's, uh, he fights with much energy and with much uh, vehemence against the tyrant and the words of young Seward, thou liest about tyrant with my sword, I'll prove the lie to you. The lie thou speakest and they fight and young Seward is slain. Uh, it, it's important that uh, Macbeth's first encounter in this fight is not with Macduff, uh, who is not born of woman, or Malcolm, but uh, with this young boy. Uh, the way in which uh, they fight and Macbeth ultimately kills him is represented or, or is used by Shakespeare for two points. One is that it helps Macbeth to still feel that he can defeat anyone, that he is invincible and therefore he could kill young Seward so easily. But there is also the second important point that it makes a relation between the young and the old and here Shakespeare is saying that the old triumphs or a person who has a much more experience than young Seward triumphs. So at one point uh, simultaneously therefore at the same time there is a triumph of experience and at the same time, Shakespeare also adds subtly that this experience or this triumph of experience is just one of the examples of egotism because really this action caters to Macbeth's egotism. And then, of course, 
the entry of Macduff. Tyrant, show thy face, if thou beest slain, and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children ghosts will haunt me still. I cannot strike at wretched kerns whose arms are hired to bear their staves. And uh, therefore, uh, it's uh, when, when Macduff enters and he begins his assault against Macbeth, uh, it's important that through this speech we understand that the first level of assault is, is a personal grievance because Macbeth had murdered his wife and child but uh, later on of course it moves on to a much more general uh, cast because Macduff really wants to deliver Scotland from the evils of the tyrant and after this there is the further entry of the elder Edward and Malcolm the and the elder Edward says this way my lord the castle is gently to render the tyrant's people on both sides to fight the noble things too bravely in the war the day almost itself professes yours and little is to do and malcolm responds we have met with foes that strike beside us um, it's important that at this point seward does not know uh, that his son has been killed um, by or has been defeated by macbeth and um, he tells that there are Thanes of Scotland who bravely fight in the war. Uh, it's important, uh, even though we have discussed this point before, that in this civil war there is very little difference between the friend and the enemy as it happens during any war, any civil war in a country where people of a certain land rebel against others in their own land. And see what mentions that the noble Thanes, the noble Thanes of Scotland, are fighting against their tyrannical king so well. And just the addition that Malcolm makes that uh, it's because that they have met with their enemy, even though that enemy is from the same country. It's it's very important that scenes like this really uh, relate to us even now, where there are people of a country rebelling and standing against people of their own country and there are authorities of a certain country uh, attempting to crush the rebellion of, of 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 people whose identity whose national identity is the same as this the final scene in William Shakespeare's Macbeth act 5 scene 8 is important for a number of reasons one the, the first in terms of event where uh, the, the the final of the witches equivocations and is resolved second through a dramatization of macbeth's realization and attainment of tragic wisdom and a final cathartic understanding and a purgation of the self. Third, the final resolution of poetry in the play. And fourth, the stance through which we relate to a tragedy, which is the end of tragedy, how to be understand tragedy and what do we actually take away from it once we witness it is tragedy something which we directly associate with our life or is tragedy a form of art from which we keep ourselves at a distance it is these primarily these four things which are at the center of this final scene in my bed uh, the scene begins with Macbeth saying, Why should I play the Roman fool and die on my own sword while I see lives the caches do better upon them? So, uh, like uh, he is here comparing himself to the Roman fool, and we will remember that in a previous scene in Act 5, he had talked about life as a tale of sound and fury, and it's a tale told by an idiot or a fool. And here, of course, uh, he names himself. Or, or questions why he should be playing the role of the fool and die in his own sword or for his own reasons. Uh, so it's really a way of a character having made a much more general statement before but coming to realize that he is really part of that 
prophetic statement which he himself had made and then the entry of Macduff the foil of Macbeth uh, all men else I have avoided of all men else I have avoided thee but get thee back my soul is too much charged with blood of thine already so here Macbeth still wants to provoke Macduff uh, uh, by talking about the murder of his wife and child so that Macduff becomes more aggrieved and they begin fighting and Macbeth says thou losest labor because there's still the words of the witches in his mind that really no one of woman born will be able to kill him and he says this that I bear a charmed life which must not yield to one of woman born and Macduff at this point says despair thy charm and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped so uh, Macduff's case is what we call in a modern parlance a kind of a premature delivery so uh, he was untimely ripped from his mother's womb so uh, so in that sense he was not directly didn't come out of the mother's womb during the set time uh, untimely uh, a premature delivery a kind of a cesarean operation which uh, was not something which was uh, would take place in the Shakespearean time but it was something like uh, unlike a normal delivery where uh, the child's body the child's head especially is attached to the mother's navel cord and therefore uh, Macduff's birth was of a different kind and he was not exactly born from he was born of a mother but not exactly linked biologically to the mother's navel cord and therefore it is said that he was not born of woman and since Macduff here makes this clarification it is at that point that Macbeth realizes again the unraveling of one of the statements of the witches uh, but still uh, a few more additional points which we have discussed before that uh, the words of the witches here the re their equivocation is associated with the word charm and we will remember in one of the previous acts the witches when they are when they were talking to Macbeth and after they had finished their conversation they had said that they that they have no more to say and they add that the charms wound up so uh, really what Macbeth is told if we uh, keep in mind the, the the topic the theme of the supernatural in this play then it will be remembered that uh, whatever is told to Macbeth as part of the equivocation is, is almost like a series of charms which are cast upon him and which he really needs to break out of and since he doesn't others do it for him and what he finds in himself is just shock and surprise um, therefore uh, Macbeth finally realizes that the words of the witches were really curses which had been cast on him and Macduff says that then eat the coward and live to be the show and gaze of the time we'll have thee as our rarer monsters painted on a pole so basically he, he says to Macbeth that his head will be cut off and put on a pole for everyone to see that this is the head of a tyrant who has been justifiably punished and the response that Macbeth makes very important I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble scars so Macbeth says that he really will not give up even after he realizes to what extent he has been egotistical to what extent he has been cursed to what extent he has gone wrong this this moment of tragic defiance is something which makes Macbeth the villain into Macbeth the tragic hero it is at this stance it is in this position in this ex in this realization that of course what he has done is wrong and that he is not undoing it he is not uh, saying that uh, he is really regretting his crimes he accepts all of it but still that he will not give up that he will die fighting and he will not 
bend his knee before the newly crowned king Malcolm and he will not be uh, really uh, assaulted by the whole of the crowd and even though everything is gone against nature for example woods have moved uh, it, it, it's not really literally that woods have moved but something like that has actually happened so even though everything is, is unnatural is happening woods are moving and a person not born of woman is before him he will still fight like a warrior with his quote unquote warlike shield and uh, it's really with this defiance of the weak it's very important that we understand this, that it's not the defiance of a hero it's the defiance of a person who has been defeated and therefore all the more uh, poignant all the more uh, touching in that sense and therefore Macbeth says that he'll continue to fight in this way till the heavens really cry out that it's enough and then all of them exit fighting and then of course the final flourish and the crowning of Malcolm and where Malcolm says I would the friends we miss were safe arrived uh, talking about a new series of friends the English friends that is um, and uh, then Ross says yours and then Ross reports to Elder Seward that his son is dead and he had died fighting with Macbeth and Seward's response uh, it, it's important that in this play there is a number of references to patricide and uh, it would be important both the students attempt attempting the theme of patricide in their term papers as well as uh, generally for an understanding of the play to consider to what extent it's uh, important uh, patricide generally means the killing of the father by the son uh, but in this play we have references to the killing of the father figure by the son like uh, figure and however there is also the thing which is in opposition to this that is the that is sons being mourned by their father it's it's important because in this play the relationship between fathers and sons and father figures and son like uh, characters are so intimate and uh, they really represent a kind of and an any kind of an assault on this relationship is really one of the most unnatural acts acts that happen in this play therefore uh, like the mourning of magda for his son similarly the mourning of seward for his son he's worth no more they say he parted well and paid his score and so god be with him here comes newer comfort so seward is not really a grieving uh, his son's death as a personal loss but he says that his son had served well had had served the country well had served the cause well and therefore his death is something which is like patriot's death it should be glorified and and god is with this death which was so which had served the country well uh, in 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 so far as this whole idea is associated with the the relationship between fathers and sons it is related to the theme of patricide even though i'm not exactly talking about the killing of the father figure by the son but it's also important that in a shakespearean play who is a father and who is a son uh, uh, for example when we are discussing or we are trying to understand the theme of patricide it's not only important to talk about the killing aspect it's also important to talk about what exactly do we mean by the father figure and what exactly do we mean by the son for example uh, duncan and macbeth do not share a biological bond but they are like father and son what are the premises of it for example duncan and lady macbeth are not son and daughter 
but of course one sees upon the other lady macbeth for example sees upon king duncan as a father figure what are the premises of it in in shakespeare this relationship between in in in, in hollandshed's chronicles there is a slight mention of of lady macbeth seeing uh, duncan as the father figure or or the presiding a uh, king of scotland as the father figure because her own father at cert, at a certain point of time had ruled scotland so this relationship between kings and the king's relationship with the subject is almost like the father son or, or, or the father war the word meaning w a r d word meaning children uh, the relationship between the king and the subject is like the relationship between the father and his children or his words uh so it's it's important that we are here talking about a natural relationship which is um, assaulted which is violated and therefore uh, very unnatural and in this play there are a number of things which nature has really deemed uh, for us and which human beings violent all the time and therefore uh, we shouldn't be really so surprised when nature comes back and does things which seem unnatural and therefore shock and surprise and finally destroy us therefore uh, again uh, going back to the words of macbeth that you know very unnatural things are happening and so he's he's really astonished and destroy it completely and finally the entry of macduff a uh, hail king for so thou art behold where stands the usurper's cursed head the time is free i see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl that speak my salutation in their minds whose voice i desire loud with mine hail king of scotland and all the rest hail him as the future king um uh, it's important that uh, macbeth's the play Shakespeare ends uh the play by Shakespeare on Macbeth does not end with the final words of Macbeth it it ends with the future king of Scotland um and however we we do remember that it was um prophesied that Malcolm wouldn't or more Malcolm successors wouldn't be the future rulers of Scotland so uh, he would be he would again face civil war and he would be replaced by banquo's successors who will become future kings of Scotland so in this regard keeping in mind the words of the witches at the back of our mind we are to read the final words of malcolm who has gained the throne for now but is not going to remain on the throne for long and it's so similar to the beginning of the play that it begins with duncan where duncan really doesn't stay on the throne for long so as with father so with son finally malcolm we shall not spend the large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you my thanes and kinsmen henceforth be earls the first that ever scotland in such an honor named what's more to do which would be planted newly with the time as calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny producing for the cruel ministers of the dead butcher and his fiend like queen uh, this 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 line has been often uh used as a landmark quote of the of, of this play to to signify the villainy of both the macbeths that is macbeth and lady macbeth and uh, that one is the dead butcher and the other is his fiend like queen and when we discuss uh, and when we understand the characterization and the representation of both macbeth and lady macbeth it could be questioned whether macbeth is solely the said the dead butcher in this play and is lady macbeth only the fiend like queen in this play and are they not anything more than these and therefore uh, uh what is important in the first part of malcolm's speech is that he talks about the loyalty of the thanes and the kinsmen who's going to serve him he talks about honor he talks about uh, making a uh, people his friends who are going to loyally serve him so basically as a king he is calling upon loyalty from all sectors so that he may rule well uh something which we fee and and he says that this kind of a loyalty is, is important to really uh, overcome the the 
and and these people had had fled scotland because a tyrant a watchful tyrant was ruling them and therefore since times in scotland have changed therefore they can all come back so uh, malcolm is not only talking about loyalty he's saying that loyal people can come back to scotland because now uh, scotland is all peaceful and all stable and therefore we will perform in measure time and place so thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned its scone uh, it's important that we analyze a bit of this speech because it's the final statement uh, of the play um, therefore uh, the first part of the speech which is talking about this newly crowned state this newly crowned ruler this newly crowned peace and stability uh, all being held by the new ruler uh, which is really put in a bit of irony in an ironical stance because we remember at the back of our mind the words of the which is that this peace and stability is not going to be there for long secondly this final theatrical element or this element of show of a ceremony which is going to take place here of course very literally talking about the coronation ceremony of malcolm at scone and he's inviting really um, the people of scotland and and all loyal serving members to come and witness his coronation which is really a kind of an invitation for a ceremony uh, to be compared to uh, a play as a ceremony which the playwright calls upon the audience to come and to call call upon the people to come and witness as audience so uh, the final words in this play are not just about coronation but it's also about ceremony it's, it's also about witnessing of actions and uh, when we witness such actions it's important that we witness it only as as if we are going to an invited occasion an invited occasion is not really it's it's something which comes out of our life which which really makes its way which may make its way a bit back into our lives but it's not exactly life itself it, it's it's something external to it and therefore uh, this this final statement could also be used as a metaphor for our understanding of of tragedy that uh, it's it's a part of life it's it's art it's something different from life even though related to it and therefore our response to tragedy is to understand is to put ourselves uh in front of all these characters and really measure our actions our ambitions our pride our four flaws our fall and our destruction like happening on the characters on stage but at the end of the day to learn from it and finally um, to almost cleanse ourselves of all of these fatal of uh, to cleanse ourselves of all of these inherent flaws and to attain a purgation of the self and uh, with this cleansing of ourselves the tragedy ends and since it accomplishes it with so much grandness it is a grand and a very rooted ending thank you